back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawe Lucas here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. This Friday, we're going to take on an issue, the expansion of Papahānau Mokuakea Marine National Monuments expansion, proposed expansion. It's um, one of those issues that has caused um, some interesting um, pushback who one would say, well, of course, we want to protect our marine resources. We want to um, uh, take advantage of the incredibly efficient way the ocean um, helps us combat uh, climate change, all those things. And yet, it's proved to be somewhat divisive here in, in Hawaii. And um, I have a couple of, uh, of scientists who are going to help me address it today. And we'll start by looking at a video that the uh, Pew Charitable Trust put together to talk about the expansion. Papanau Mukuakea is a very special place. There are corals found in the Northwestern Hawaiians that aren't found anywhere else. Bob Richmond is a marine biologist with expertise in climate change and coral reef ecology. In his work, he's seen firsthand the decline in the global health of our seas. And there's no place on Earth that really is um, removed from human influences. And whether it be a local influence like sedimentation or overfishing or poor practices, nothing can escape climate change right now. And that's one of the reasons why Papa and Aumokuakea is so critically important. It is a way of building resilience in to protect populations that can seed areas that have been damaged uh, due to human influences close by. As the world's largest carbon sink, the ocean plays a critical role in regulating the climate. By increasing ocean health, marine reserves are one of the most efficient means to protect Earth and its climate. The bigger the monument, the better the impact that it has in terms of achieving the goals and objectives of protection. By establishing a larger boundary, it makes a big difference in terms of adding new deep sea features. In the area proposed for expansion, scientists are discovering new deep sea species, such as fish and invertebrates. Some ecosystems in the area are home to species that haven't been found anywhere else. Expanding the monument will protect these species and the broader ocean ecosystem. We see just a fraction of the world's oceans that are in any kind of protection at all. About 2% of the ocean is designated as highly protected, but scientists say we need to set aside 30% of the ocean to safeguard it for future generations. By establishing the, a larger boundary that people are hoping for, it will establish the largest marine protected area in the world. No place on Earth is left as a refuge unless we choose to have it. I don't think that Hawaiian culture and science are in conflict. I think there is a lot of overlap. Narissa Spees is a graduate student at the Kewalo Marine Laboratory. I got to go to Midway Atoll, uh, or Pihe Manu in Hawaiian, and it was like nothing I could have expected. There were so many birds there, and it was so noisy but amazing. It had quite an impact on me. Narissa was born and raised in Hawaii. As a child, she went fishing with her father off the Kona coast. When we were going from catching 30 ono in one weekend, down to you're lucky if you get one or two, my dad stopped fishing completely. So I did see that things decline at a, a really quick rate. Narissa wants to ensure this doesn't happen in a place as sacred as Papa Hanau Mokuakea. Not only is it special to me now, but it's been special to my kupuna, my ancestors, you know, the people that came before me. And that is something that, that'll be important for my children and my grandchildren, I hope, one day. My sincere apologies to Pew Trust. Uh, we had some sort of odd technical thing happening there. Um, uh, my guests, uh, Dr. Robert Richmond, and uh, who's the director of the Kiwalo Marine Laboratory, and also in the video, Nerissa Spees, who is a PhD student there. 
um, are not shape shifters. Um, they are just wonderful human beings who have dedicated their lives to the, um, the ocean and, and researching it. And they're here with me uh, as living proof. <laughs> Thank you both for coming, and I, I really apologize. I don't know what happened. It was just one of those technical things. But anyway. Hey, I've never been told I look better in person than I do in video, so <laughs> that's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> so things are, are funny, but they're also not funny. Um, there's been some rather serious accusations and, and, and misinformation thrown around. I um, first saw you two, heard you two um, talking about this, at the five hour long OHA te community testimony. Um, and um, that was quite, quite a day. Um, <clears throat> so I was really so um, grateful to hear your very low key, very, very systematic um, scientific approach to the, um, to the whole issue. So would you please talk about the um, w why this is important for us to, to be embracing now. Well, let me uh, start and then I'd be very happy if Narissa could take over. But from the science side, the science is the easy one. Um, initially, uh, and I guess to this moment, there are people still saying that there's no science to support it, and that's absolutely false. The science in support of this is overwhelming. And it's not just the two of us that agree, um, but we have over 1,500 scientists who just uh, were participating or associated with the International Coral Reef Symposium last week who agree with us. And if you look at the main signatories on that, these are luminaries of science. So Stephen Plumby is the director of the Hopkins Marine Laboratory for Stanford University, member of the National Academies of Science. You know, if you can't trust this guy when it comes to science, it's done for the rest of us. Um, it's just very, very clear. Um, the importance of these large marine protected areas. It's an opportunity we'll never ever see again. Um, if you were to choose the ideal marine protected area, you would look for something that was large, um, somewhat isolated with a history of either de facto or real protections. Um, it would contain a diversity of habitats and associated organisms, and Papanamokuakea has all of that. The addition is in a world of climate change where we see the world around us changing um, radically. And for those of us that deal with these data every day, it's quite concerning um, that we don't want to bum people out and just say it's over. You know, as uh, Terry Hughes, well, again, one of the luminaries of science said, we're not willing to write the obituary for coral reefs nor for the oceans. And it's opportunities like this that give me hope when we see broad support. Um, if we look at climate change, this contains some of the northernmost coral reefs in the world. And it is also a perfect place location as fish are moving away from what's called the Western Pacific Warming Pool. It's a part of the central, uh, well, Western Pacific near the equator that's warming up more than other places. Fish are getting pushed to the north and they're getting pushed to the east right towards Papanamokuakea. And fishermen know this too because during El Nino years, um, fishing increases tremendously in the Pacific Remote Islands. So this is a perfect place to be able to set aside as a legacy for the future. Um, Bob, let's see if we can um, look at the couple of maps um, as you're explaining what were, um, what the, this is, um, this is the earlier one. So this is, some people are familiar with this because um, this was originally what was uh, put out. I think this one is by the Pew Trust also. And then a little bit later, you can see on, on the right-hand side near Kauai that um, it's changed. So the, when, when you were talking about the areas you were talking about for the, the warm, uh, for the fish, the warming pools and so forth, what sort of areas are, are we talking about when we look at the... Yeah, so the Western Pacific warming pool is nowhere to be seen on this map. That's way over by Indonesia. Oh, So it's okay. way over there. What this is is the perfect catcher's mitt for things that are moving across the Pacific, um, looking for a safe haven, looking for a place to be able to escape some of the worst impacts of climate change. And so this is kind of their version of Nirvana. Um, I'll just say that if we take a look at what a large MPA is like, it's like a bank account. A large MPA? What would an MPA be? A marine protected area. Thank, Thank you. you. So a large marine protected area is like a bank account for the future. Um, everything that's in it is your principal. Everything that's produced within that area that can leave is called your interest. And so there's something called spillover, which is basically the reproductive output that occurs within this area spilling over. And one of the best examples I've ever seen is off of Monterey, California, um, where 
uh, you can tell exactly where the boundaries are for their large marine protected area because there's 48 vessels lined up in a row right around this border within one inch of it, capturing all the reproductive output and all the fish that are spilling over. So this map shows the extent of the area that if it's set aside, will be the largest marine protected area in the world. <laughs> but to put it in perspective, during the Coral Reef Symposium, our keynote speaker was President Tommy Romangasau, the president of Palau. They've just established 80% of their exclusive economic zone, their EEZ, in full protection, with 20% left over for local fishing. Um, wow. That translates to 36 square kilometers for every Palauan on the earth is set aside for ocean protection for everybody. If, in fact, President Obama does sign this into the expansion um, into law, um, it'll basically be the largest MPA in the world, but that equates to 0 0.005 square kilometers for every American, five orders of magnitude lower. Okay. Um, uh, Narissa, what, what, what is really the, the key here for you? Or perhaps you can just speak to how you came to do this work and what, your, what moved you to take it on. Sure. So. Um, uh, you've heard a lot of really great science. Papahanaumokuakea is actually one of those unique places where nature and science um, blend perfectly well together, and they're actually um, cornerstones of the area. So um, the, the monument was actually declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site based on those two criteria, the culture and nature, together. Um, so it makes it a really strong uh, candidate to be protected and expanded, um, but also that there's not just excellent science there. This is something that um, has been and continues to be important culturally to Native Hawaiians. Um, the, uh, the area itself, you know, the name Papahanaumokuakea means the place from which all life springs because in, you know, Hawaiian, um, our genealogy, uh, the Kumulipo, this is the place where life originated on earth. Well, I think we'll use that as a, a gentle transition to our break and then we'll co come back and talk more about the expansion of Papahanaumokuakea. Aloha, my name is John Waihe'e, and I used to be a part of all the things that you might be angry at. I served in government here and may have made decisions that affects you. So I want to invite you in. I want to invite you in to talk story with me and some very special guests every other Monday here at Talk Story with John Wahee. Come on in, join us, express your opinion, learn more about your state, and then do something about it. Aloha. Aloha, this is Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii and Think Tech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We're here to inform, motivate, and entertain you. Join us. Hola, soy María Mera y estoy aquí para invitaros a mi show bilingüe Viva Hawaii en Cintec Hawaii cada dos lunes a las 3 de la tarde. Estamos aquí para informaros, motivaros y entreteneros. Apuntaros. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas and with me to here today is Bob Richmond and Narissa Spies from both from the Kualo uh, Marine Laboratory here in Honolulu. So, Narissa, um, part of the uh, testimony I heard at, at OHA was about how um, there are, we have quotas, and for those of us who aren't really in the fishing world, it's, it's a bit confusing how all these quotas work. Can you explain that a bit? Sure. So um, for the Hawaii longlining fisher, fishermen um, every year, for big eye tuna specifically, um, they have a set amount of quota that's based on good science. So. Um, they look at uh, the, the number that's been caught and they use this to determine how much um, sustainably we can catch for the future um, every year. So in Hawaii last year, for example, um, that quota, that amount of fish that we're, they're able to catch um, was caught out in the full year only in about six or seven months. Yeah. Okay, and um, do we know how much of that uh, if any of it was caught in the area that is affected in, um, would be affected by the expansion of Kapahana Mokokea? So um, over the last decade, traditionally um, seven to 10 percent of the catch has come from that area. And last year, actually about five percent of the total catch uh, effort was in the area that we're proposing for expansion. Okay, so so in seven months, um, the, the total quota is 
is met for for fish in for fishing in these Hawaiian waters. Yes, it was last year. Um, okay. And rather than stopping fishing, that's not what happened. Actually, the um, additional quota was purchased from other areas of the Pacific, places like uh, CNMI. Um, and rather than fishing there, it was actually still caught here in Hawaiian waters, which I don't believe is sustainable. Um, how how is that? able to happen. The uh, Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas are really far away from us, that they're not the same, they're not the same waters. I mean, it wouldn't be the same fish. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. And that's it. They can buy quota. They bought quota from the Northern Mariana Islands and from American Samoa, and yet they come back. So if uh, William Isla gives a great example, if there was a quota for how many trees you could take out of a person's forest, and you've already taken out those 10, then you go back and you get quota from somebody else and come back and take another 20 from that same forest, it's unsustainable. And that's the issue, and a lot of us are asking the same question, how can you buy quota from another part of the world and then come back and fish the same areas that are already areas that need to be protected? That's pretty, pretty stunning. So who's, who, who manages that? Two, um, internationally is where the quota is set and the United States is a signatory on it, um, but the United States is responsible for anything within uh, 200 miles of the land masses here. That's called the exclusive economic zone. So that raises another point when people say, well, this is going to be a huge takeaway from Hawaii. Hawaii's uh, laws only allow with the federal law. Um, 12 miles from shore is under Hawaii state jurisdiction. Anything from 12 to 200 is already federal. So the existing boundaries, um, and let's have a, a look at the, that second map that shows the, the buoy um, that's sort of relevant. There we go. Um, so the explain um, the what's what on on this please the sure um, so this map actually is uh, courtesy of uh, Senator Schatz's office so this is a modified map that shows um, the current boundary in blue and the area that we're proposing for expansion expansion outlined in red um, and then top right corner of the current monument or the current monument you can see a buoy that um, is still fished by small boat fishermen from Kauai and Ihau. Um, and after direct um, talks with fishermen on, in those areas, this is the map that was released. We, we have listened to their concerns, and we don't want to impact anybody who's going to you know, feed their family locally, the small boat guys, the guys like my dad that would go out on the weekends and, and catch fish. Because how, how far could you go on a weekend? I mean, could you, could you go, how far could you go? Could you go past the, much past the buoy? Or? So Papahanaumokuakea spans 1,200 miles. Now that yeah. is definitely out of range for the small boat guys like my dad. Um, this is technically doable. This is a, it's a, it's a longer run, um, but it's doable for small boat guys. So we really don't want to impact local fishing that way. So if the expansion is uh, approved, um, what kind of access will be allowed for native Hawaiians or any kind of fishermen? Is, is it going to be absolutely off limits or can some people go or is there a process for, for access? Yeah. Um, so again, this has been part of the discussion. I've been more involved in the science side, but I am privy and Narissa can jump in as well. Um, the idea there is the data show from discussions with OHA they um, are involved in permitting. So it's an area that has restrictions to it, and not anybody can go up and do anything. So that's the whole idea of setting areas aside. It's like a national park. You can't go in and start lumbering. Um, but there are things you can do with a permit. Yeah. Um, more people have been able to go up in the last year or two years than ever before. Um, so they do have a very well-established permitting system. And as Narissa pointed out, that I think, again, people have listened very carefully to the stakeholders. And it's very important to separate out long-line commercial fishing from the small boat fishing. And um, you know, you're talking one, uh, if you look at the um, uh, Star Advertiser editorial today, they make uh, mention of 47 million hooks being set. You know, we discuss that as a wall of hooks, that it actually is a barrier million. between the ocean and the small boat fishermen. Small boat fishermen in Guam, when uh, we were involved, I lived there for 18 years and was involved in the establishment of marine protected areas there. Um, it was really interesting to see that uh, a allocation for local, what they call Manamco, elders, to fish from shore with hook and line was fine. You can do that in MPA. That wasn't the issue. It was um, commercial fishing. It was the large nets. It was uh, scuba flashlight spear fishing. So this allocation for local fishers is, makes total sense, and scientifically it's supported as well. But again, that doesn't block access to other things. There are boats going up for research. There are boats going up for observation. There are boats, as uh, Narissa said, for culture. And this is where you see the harmony between the Western biology and the culture, 
what we call biocultural resources that are in complete harmony, that both groups agree that this is a really, really good thing. So um, it seems like there's been a lot of, um, I was reading some of the letters. Oh, oh, we have a call. We're going to take a call. How about that? Hello? We're listening. Hello? Hello? I'm not hearing anything. Hi. Speak up, please. Hello? Hello? Hi, this is Kawi Lucas with Hi. Hawaii is my mainland. Who am I talking to? Um, this is Laurie. I'm calling from the island of Molokai. Laurie from Molokai. What's yes. your question? Hello? Lori? Hi. Yes, what is your question? Yes. What is your question? Oh, I don't think we have a good connection. My question is, um, my question is that um, we here on Molokai like to preserve our resources. And I, I cannot see why um, there would be any negative um, fallback from trying to preserve our marine resources. But I talked to legislators who are opposing the expansion, and the reason was because the price of fish for local people in Hawaii would soar. That, and Lori, I don't know that is how a, good, that is that a is very true. good question. Can, can I, I, yes, um, th thank you, Lori. That is a very good question. So she's from calling from Molokai, and she says that they. Um, they are um, really on board with um, uh, preservation there, but that she's talked to some of the politicians who were against the expansion. And uh, the reason they gave was that it would um, drive up the prices for local fish. So um, thank you for that, um, please. Thank you, Lori. Um, yeah, so this is the type of misinformation that we're having to address when we talk to people in the public. Again, the big eye is set on a quota system. The amount of fish that they're allowed to take will not change at all. It will not, it will not affect the amount of fish they catch. We're just asking them to move over slightly to catch it, that's all. And they're already fishing. 95% of their catch last year came from outside of the EEZ anyway. Okay, so outside of the EEZ, which at this point is, is only how, how many miles? 200. 200, yeah, okay. So basically it's the area that they're already moving to, but you were there at the OHA hearing when in fact they were asked how much of the fish that's caught gets exported, and they said uh, nearly 50%, it depends on the year. So once again, not only can they make quota, and they've been doing so in less than a year, so they're buying quota from elsewhere, but uh, that number yeah. was the number you heard as well. Absolutely. I was kind of surprised that that number came up. If that's being exported to California and other markets, we know that some of the stuff coming in for pokey here is not locally caught fish. It's the, what they call the carbon monoxide fish coming in from foreign fishing. Foreign fishing? Foreign fishing. Uh, foreign sources. Foreign sources. Okay. So it, is that, are they, do they label that fresh or how do we know what, no. what that is when um, we're... Next Shopping time you go to, go to the store, um, you'll see a lot of the stuff that comes in will say carbon monoxide treated or, or previously frozen. That's the type of stuff you're, you're eating in your poke. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you for that question. That was um, one of the, the things that um, came up at, at the yeah. OHA meeting. So another one of the, the concerns was that, um, and this was uh, from the Peter Oppose article in the uh, Civil Beat, um, with only the president's signature and without public discussion, federal control over access to Hawaii's ex oceans will expand by 75%. What do you think? So, um, yes, so pan so it would expand in support of protections, definitely. Um, president Obama can sign this into law using the Antiquities Act, though the same way it was created. Ten years ago, President Bush used the Antiquities Act to establish the monument. Um, we have asked, and Senator Schatz has emphasized, that he would like to see um, local meetings held on Oahu and Kauai in order to hear concerns of the community before this expansion goes through. Wow, so that, that should be happening pretty soon then. Um, is there, um, do you, uh, not that this is your kuleana <laughs> as researchers, <laughs> but is, is there some place that you know of where people can go and get information about when, when those uh, meetings might be happening and where they might be happening? 
um, we've just been included in some of the recent emails. And, um, you know, it's typical of the Obama administration. They've tried to be consultive, even if they don't have to be. And uh, as Narissa said very correctly in the past, it's just the Antiquities Act. All it requires is a signature. Uh, but we understand that there will be meetings in Kauai because those fishers are most affected. And also on Oahu because it's a, kind of this uh, state seat. Uh, a lot of people here. But my understanding is they want to have at least two rounds of public input, um, one set of meetings in Kauai and one set of meetings here on Oahu. Okay, and I will have all of the information that I can gather um, on the follow-up blog to this today's show at kawilucas.com uh, with links to the relevant sites and um, uh, and 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 the whole video, <laughs> the whole beautiful video of that the Pew Charitable Trust put together with the just the most gorgeous gorgeous um, beings. Can you speak to some of the, the really interesting creatures that, that are down there in our last minute? Sure. Um, so the Okeanos Explorer is a NOAA um, deep submersible ve uh, vehicle. And in the last um, few months, they've discovered amazing things up there. In uh, February and March, they did a deep dive, and they discovered more than 200 new species. Wow. Um, basically, everywhere they're looking, they're finding incredible diversity and brand new animals we've never seen before. And it's particularly exciting, too, because, you know, a lot of us look at the big things, the animals and, you know, the world's largest sponge was just found down there. Um, in the shallow water, about 25% of the uh, fish and other animals that have been found are what we call endemic, found in Hawaii and nowhere else. As you go to deeper water, it goes up to 100%. They're found nowhere else in the world than here. What a special place. Um, but the other part that's interesting is many of these have very interesting um, chemical compounds in them. Uh, the area of study is called natural products chemistry, but from marine organisms there have been uh, chemicals that have been shown to have anti-cancer activity, anti-AIDS activity, uh, antibiotics against some of the superbugs. And, you know, if we don't even know what's up there, how can we risk losing things that may end up having the ultimate um, protection, the ultimate uh, medical response to some of the world's most ravaging diseases? Oh, I am so glad that you both were able to tear yourselves away from that gorgeous place, your marine okay. lab. Oh my gosh. There at Point Panic, um, you have one of the most gorgeous uh, offices, I think, on the planet. Um, but thanks for coming and helping to explain some of the um, um, sort of difficult um, things about this uh, expansion that is really, they're not difficult. It's just a presentation. Thanks very much, Cal. We appreciate it. And as we go out, we're going to show some of the beautiful creatures that um, um, oh, Darissa was talking about, and um, maybe even the the albatross, the fifty-six year old wisdom the albatross. Wisdom the albatross. We didn't get to talk about wisdom. Who's that fifty-six year old mommy? <laughs> what an appropriate name. <laughs>